Now, this may come as a surprise to some, but Thrasher is actually not a clothing company. Shocker, right? Long before celebrities and hypebeasts were spotted wearing Thrasher as a way to be edgy or part of counterculture, Thrasher started off as a skateboarding magazine way back in 1981. It's commonly referred to as the Skateboarder's Bible and has been covering skateboarding culture for decades. They've often gone against the grain and established a rough and rowdy image, and many skaters would say they capture the true spirit of skateboarding. Thrasher definitely isn't the only skateboarding magazine to ever be made, but it's by far the most popular and it's one of the only magazines that stood the test of time. With that said, thanks to its popularity, Thrasher has had no shortage of controversies. From the start, this gritty underground magazine has made waves both inside and outside of skateboarding, and recently has somehow made its way into the mainstream. Many have argued that Thrasher has eventually grown to be a victim of its own success, and has become the very thing it used to be against, while others have said that it's still the same company that it always has been and always will be. Regardless of which side you agree with, the reach and influence of Thrasher is undeniable, and the path the company has paved over the years is one of the most interesting stories in counterculture. This is the story of Thrasher Magazine. The origins of Thrasher start with two men, Eric Swinson and Fausto Vitello. Eric and Fausto were both born in 1946, and they both grew up in San Francisco, California. As with many other young men at the time, they enjoyed playing guitar, listening to punk rock music, and repairing motorcycles. Naturally, when they first met in the 1960s while serving in the Army Reserve, they quickly bonded over their shared interests. This would be the start of a lifelong friendship between the two. After getting out of the army, Eric and Fausto decided to start a business together, but they hadn't yet considered making a magazine. Instead, they had the idea to start selling skateboard trucks. Skateboarding had just seen a massive boom in the 60s and 70s, and since they were familiar with the culture, they figured it would be a good plan. Unfortunately, their first truck design was clunky and complicated, and it also didn't work that well, so it was basically a flop. Not yet ready to give up on their plan, they partnered up with Richard Novak and Jay Sherman in 1978 and co-founded Independent Truck Company. With the new and improved design of their trucks, they managed to blend durability with functionality, which was something that no truck company back then had done successfully. This was a big deal at the time, and they started getting sales almost immediately. Within six months, Independent captured about 50% of the skateboarding truck market. Sadly, just as they were gaining a foothold in the skateboarding industry, skateboarding as a whole was beginning to die down. Many people considered it to be a fad that had passed, and in many ways, it was. If we were to ride this square of cement right here, then you could arrest us. But if we were to ride on that square of cement over there, you couldn't arrest us. Technically, yes. Tons of skate parks and skateboarding companies were closing, and the market as a whole was beginning to dry up. Even the top skate magazine at the time pivoted away from skateboarding and instead chose to focus on things like horseback riding and motocross. The entire industry started to consolidate and dedicated core skateboarders were the only ones left. In order to keep independent trucks going, Fausto and Eric needed a way to advertise their products to the few skaters who were still going, which was getting increasingly difficult to do. No one wanted anything to do with skateboarding, so their options were incredibly limited. Ultimately, they decided that if all the other companies and magazines weren't going to cover skateboarding, they would simply have to do it themselves. Just like that, Thrasher Magazine was born. Unlike previous skateboard magazines that were polished and professional, Thrasher took a much more casual and realistic approach. The magazine covered actual skateboarding culture and had a much stronger punk rock attitude. They didn't care about random skate contests or who the trendy new skater was. They only cared about core, authentic skate culture. Since the only skateboarders left were hardcore enthusiasts, this style appealed to them directly, and it was a major success. The topics they covered, the way they covered them, and the buy skaters for skaters mentality that they had strongly resonated with core skateboarders. Even the name Thrasher itself was thought of by Dwayne Peters, who at the time was one of the top pros, and was essentially the epitome of a hardcore skater. From the start, they got tons of backlash from parents as well as other skate brands, but if anything, it just made them double down. The more they embraced the hate they got from the outside, the more their fan base of real skateboarders grew. 
Throughout the rest of the 80s and into the early 90s, Thrasher continued its reign as the number one skateboarding publication. Other skateboarding magazines did come about, but none of them captured the core skateboarding audience in quite the same way. Then, in 1993, Thrasher promoted Jake Phelps to editor, which was a pivotal moment in the history of the company. Jake Phelps was a punk rock skateboarder, who somewhat embodied the spirit of Thrasher. While most magazine editors probably spend the majority of their time in their office, Jake spent most of his time out on skate missions. For years, he didn't even have a computer, email, or voicemail. Jake is literally the person who coined the phrase skate or die, and is largely responsible for much of skateboarding culture's trajectory. As the head of the biggest skateboarding publication, he had the final say on who and what got attention. Gradually, he grew to be the face of the magazine and helped expand both the company and also skateboarding as a whole. By the early 2000s, Thrasher had started up a website, which then led to a YouTube channel and other social media, and eventually a TV show. Their reach continued to grow alongside skateboarding, and today, they're bigger than ever. They post a variety of segments that skaters love, they release some of the best skateboarding videos, and they host some of the biggest skateboarding events. Without a doubt, Thrasher has grown to be one of the largest brands in skateboarding. However, in recent years, all of their success has started to come at a cost. As skateboarding's reach has expanded and the mainstream has begun to take an interest, the perception of Thrasher has also begun to change. For decades, Thrasher was known as an anti-establishment brand that was worn almost exclusively by core skateboarders. Then, sometime around 2016, Thrasher started making several costly decisions that would severely diminish the brand's reputation. See, the 2014 to 2016 era was an interesting time period when streetwear saw an exponential rise in popularity. Tons of underground brands saw massive growth as the fashion industry became obsessed with street culture. Considering skateboarding is about as underground as it gets, a lot of skateboarding adjacent brands and even a few actual skate companies got caught up in the craze. Perhaps blinded by the thought of more profits, Thrasher made the choice to start selling their products in Zoomies, which is known among skaters as a corporate mall store that essentially leeches off of skate culture. Now, if you aren't a skateboarder, you might be wondering, why does it matter if Thrasher sells their products in a mall store? What difference does it really make? Well, the problem is, it goes against everything the brand stands for. For decades, they built up their entire platform based on an anti-establishment, skate or die mentality. By making the decision to sell products in a corporate chain store in the mall that doesn't care about skating at all, they completely went against the values that they preach for so long. As the streetwear craze started to gain steam, tons of celebrities began wearing Thrasher, which in turn made it even more popular with hypebeast and other non-skaters. Although it may seem harmless, this created a major issue with the brand dynamic. When high-profile celebrities are spotted wearing an underground brand, it's hard to say that it's still considered underground, which is a major reason it appealed to skaters in the first place. By allowing their clothes to be sold in Zoomies, Thrasher made their company available to the masses, which took away part of the connection that skaters had with the brand. In a lot of ways, this move was seen as selling out, since Thrasher has always maintained a core underground culture, but then decided to sell their products in chain stores in the mall. During the craze, Jake Phelps himself called the celebrities wearing Thrasher clowns, and made it clear that they don't personally send them products to wear. However, this seemed hypocritical, since Thrasher made the choice to start selling in malls, where tons of non-skaters are inevitably going to buy it. Before they started selling in Zoomies, the only place to get Thrasher gear was either at a local skate shop or directly from the magazine. If you weren't already a dedicated skater, chances are you would never come across it. Once non-skateboarders started wearing Thrasher as a way to be edgy, it lost a lot of its appeal with actual skateboarders since it was no longer exclusively for skaters. People didn't need to put in the effort of learning how to skate, and instead, they could steal skateboarders' aesthetic by making a quick trip to the mall. To make matters worse, this massive spike in popularity caused the brand to get watered down even more when people started blatantly ripping it off. Most people don't know this, but the iconic Thrasher logo is actually made of a font called Banco. It was designed by Roger Excavon in 1951 and was mostly used by random businesses like butchers and bookstores and was even used on a Bob Marley album cover. 
Other companies still use the font occasionally after the magazine started, but mostly on a small scale in different industries, and they likely didn't even know Thrasher existed. For the most part, the font was used almost exclusively by Thrasher for decades. Once Thrasher got popular with Hypebeast and Streetwear Fanatics, other companies were quick to hop on the trend. Since so many people buying Thrasher didn't actually skate, a lot of them didn't even care if what they were buying was from the actual brand. Hundreds, if not thousands of companies started making ripoffs, and the people buying them couldn't care less. It got to the point where it started becoming a meme with skaters, and Thrasher even made a joke out of it themselves by releasing a ripoff of their own logo. This continued on for a while, and with so many ripoffs and parodies going on, many skaters just stopped wearing Thrasher. Now, as bad as it was, the hypebeast trend isn't where the issue stopped. Around the same time as the fashion trend, Thrasher also turned their popular King of the Road series into a TV show on Vice, which pushed them even further into the mainstream. Just like with selling clothes in mall stores, this was also seen as a sellout move, since for years, it was an annual series that was free to watch online. And now if you wanted to watch it, you either had to pay for cable or had to pay for Vice. Generally speaking, skateboarders don't like seeing non-skateboarders steal their culture. And since Thrasher is as core as it gets, most skaters didn't like how mainstream it was becoming. What caused even more frustration with skaters is that it seemed like Thrasher wasn't even listening to the feedback they were getting. Even after the backlash from selling in Zoomies and turning King of the Road into a TV show, Thrasher decided to do a collaboration with Lacoste which arguably caused even more outrage than their previous offenses. From an outside perspective, this might not seem like a big deal, but if you understand skating, then you'll understand why this was so detrimental. A preppy brand like Lacoste has absolutely nothing to do with skateboarding, and it definitely has nothing to do with Thrasher. When large companies like Lacoste try to come into skateboarding, it's purely because they want to make more money. They don't care about skating or skate culture, they just want to make their products seem cooler so they can increase their profits. By agreeing to the collaboration, Thrasher sold out the value of their brand, and skateboarders immediately called them out on it. They got a ton of backlash from the community, and few, if any, skateboarders actually bought the clothes they released. For decades, Thrasher has led the charge of putting skateboarding before profits, which is a major reason why skateboarding has been able to stay so pure for so long. While every other sport or activity eventually gets bought up by massive corporations, the majority of skate companies today are still skater owned and operated. Of course every company needs to make money, but true skate companies always have the best interests of skateboarding in mind. And in the past few years, the goals of Thrasher have become questionable. A lot of the moves they've been making seem like bold cash grabs. And the problem is, once you start to damage the reputation of a brand, it's difficult to repair. Now, the silver lining in all of this is that Thrasher is still redeemable. Honestly, they're still the major leader of skate culture. They have made some less than ideal decisions, but for the most part, they're largely supported by skaters. They still host great skateboarding videos, the magazine is still the same, and most of the brand's identity hasn't changed. A few of their choices haven't been the best, but that doesn't change the long history they have as a company. There are some skaters who have started to panic as Thrasher has gained more exposure, but as long as Thrasher can stick to the course they set decades ago, getting more attention doesn't have to be a bad thing. Keeping skateboarding protected from influences that don't have skateboarding's best interest is important. And despite their recent slip-ups, over the long run, they've done a decent job. While countless other companies have come and gone, Thrasher is one of the very few that stuck around, and they've done a lot for skateboarding along the way. Even with all the ups and downs, Thrasher has maintained its position as a cornerstone of skateboarding culture, and they'll likely stay that way for years to come.